basically I'd been living in a hotel room for about five or six years, you know, all over the world, and I was kind of sick of it and wanted to go home. Uh, and so in 98, I, I quit uh, and came home and uh, bought a nightclub. The customer experience has got to be the experience of the brand, and if it isn't, then, you know, they're disappointed inevitably. Yeah. There's a reluctance to get very senior people in because you don't want your own authority to be challenged, you know. You don't think anyone's ever really going to understand your vision. It keeps growing and it comes to the point where you have to start getting, you know, good quality people in. And suddenly, when you, when you get your first really good quality person in to work alongside you, it's like, oh my God, why didn't I do this before? It's, a lot of the guys who, who set up restaurants uh, don't set up a restaurant to be the next McDonald's. They set up a restaurant because they're passionate about food, passionate about people, love doing service, often these days have an interest in sustainability. Our eating habits are changing. We're demanding better dining experiences and the food market has never been so competitive. Starting and succeeding with a food business is challenging but some determined and passionate entrepreneurs are flourishing. These people have big dreams, big passion and big drive. They are disruptors, change makers and innovators. They see a positive future. Many say that food business is too risky. Some say that it has huge rewards. Are you up for the challenge? In today's episode, I sit down with Charlie McVeigh. And Charlie is an absolute legend in hospitality and the beer scene in the UK. He started as a financial journalist, but soon uh, moved into the nightclub scene where he launched uh, a club in Notting Hill. And from that point, he built uh, a number of different brands, but in particular Draft House, which he grew to 16 sites. Uh, and then finally exiting to Brewdog. He's now got numerous investments and sits on different boards and just super um, knowledgeable, experienced and very well respected uh, industry professional. So sit back, enjoy Charlie McVeigh. I'm sure you'll love it. So I know you started as a financial journalist. You, you were mentioning. Yeah, um, long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. Um, love to know, I guess, how you got into that. And did you have like a vision or a plan at that stage? It's kind of weird because it, the, when I was the, the, what I remember about being a financial journalist was it was at a time when um, you know sort of like during the Gulf War, you know. And then I woke up this morning and we're in another war. Yeah. And I haven't talked about being a financial journalist for a long time. And I, I but the first thing I thought about when I woke up is it really reminded me of 1991. Really, okay. <laughs> you know, with the first with the first Gulf War when I woke up and we'd invaded Kuwait, you know, and okay. all that kind of thing. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. Um, so I, I was, a, yeah, I was a journalist at university. Uh, so I worked for the student newspaper, um, okay. and uh, really always wanted to be a journalist and love writing, and still do. Love writing copy for businesses yeah. uh, that I'm involved in. Always wrote all the copy for Draft House, and felt it was really important that I did that um, to a, to a slightly obsessive degree. Probably okay. not that helpful because I probably spent too long on it. But um, so yeah, and then came out of. Um, uh, University, got myself a job uh, at Telegraph and then moved from there, made a mistake and went to the European, which was a sort of new newspaper yeah. run by Bob Maxwell, who was um, a notorious crook, as it turned out. Um, and that, that, didn't, that didn't last. So when that went bust, that I'd been being a journalist for about two years, I decided to go be a freelance in, 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 in Austria for a while and lived in Vienna uh, and then just sort of drifted into... Uh, out of that, drifted into management consulting, really, and became a management consultant for a while, okay. uh, and ended up working in Eastern Europe um, as the wall was coming down, so 91, 92. Interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and working for uh, a small consulting firm that was doing a sort of never-ending project for Procter & Gamble, and Procter & Gamble obviously very keen to get into Eastern Europe and, and develop those markets. And that's what I was doing. So I'm um, okay. sort of advising them on how to do that. Um, and that ended up, um, and then I ended up in the Far East and, uh, you know, doing the same thing, sort of 95 to 98. Uh, and then 
basically I'd been living in a hotel room for about five or six years, you know, all over the world. And I was kind of sick of it and wanted yeah. to go home. Uh, and so in 98, I, I quit uh, and came home and uh, bought a nightclub. And that was, that was you know, yeah. randomly. I'd saved up a bit of money and uh, ended up borrowing some money, bought a freehold on a nightclub, which was closed. And you yeah. know, that, was, that was how I got into hospitality. But, okay. um, Interesting. The yeah. super valuable skill sets you learned in those early years. I'm sure they're, they're yeah. kind of supporting I mean, you at this stage even. Yeah, I think, I think, I think there's a huge difference between advising other people on how to do things and actually doing them yourself. But yeah, no, definitely yeah. learned a lot about, I mean, I know, I know my way around a and l and a balance sheet. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I know about strategy and yeah, you know, yeah. that kind of thing, which is helpful. But sure. actually, when you're starting up a standalone nightclub in, in, in Notting Hill, and actually your, your principal objective is to have fun yeah. <laughs> rather than to make money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very easy not to make money. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it, it took about a year of losing money and um, behaving like a total idiot uh, <laughs> uh, with, with my two, my two okay. friends who I opened the nightclub with um, before we realized that we really had to stop being total idiots and start okay. making money. And, and to be fair, uh, once we made that decision, um, we have started making a lot of money uh, because it was a very successful club uh, and, and it, was, it generated an enormous amount of cash. Uh, but it was just that the first year was kind of, we had a bunch of people running the club for us really who okay. were, I mean, stealing from us stealing from each other selling drugs to yeah, yeah. each other and to the customers and just t- total disaster and okay. we were actually probably quite lucky to get away with it without being killed um uh and managed to get rid of those guys brought in some proper operators and and then it was it was amazing after that and that was the sort of beginning of 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 my really year two of the nightclub was the sort of beginning of my okay. hospitality career okay. uh because that was when i started to work out how you you know you know, operated, enforced discipline, generated cash, built sales, built brand. Sure. sure. You know, all these things. And then started adding things onto that. So we bought okay. the pub. And so that was a club called Woody's, which had been a, it had been a, uh, it was a 19th century uh, conservative party working man's club, which was a sort of kind of like a members club for yep. local conservative voters. Okay. Uh, which then turned, it was actually run by uh, a couple of, uh, an Irish couple called Des and Bridie, okay. uh, who lived on the top floor and they ran it as a nightclub. When I was growing up, we used to go there. Okay. Uh, Interesting. And, uh, and then they sold it to some property developers who uh, were going to develop it into flats because uh, it was four floors. So they were going to make it into four flats. Okay. Uh, and then for whatever reason, the numbers didn't stack up. And, and they, so they, they'd managed to preserve the license. So we bought it for very little money. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very good. And, uh, and, and yeah. from, um, I guess, being a journalist and that skill set you have, do you bring that into business in terms of being inquisitive or analytical? Is it the similar type of approach or is it, is it different? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, yes, uh, and it's a good thing and a bad thing because okay. as a journalist, particularly as a, a journalist on a daily paper, which I was yeah. on the Telegraph, it's like every day there's a new story and you get really excited about that story for one day and then you move on to the next story. And that's kind of the first job I had. Okay. And I've never really got over that kind of like, I quite, find it quite difficult to concentrate on something for a long time. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. I've got a sort of one day uh, focal, f- focal point range, okay. you know. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think that, I think, I mean, Luke Johnson, who was my chairman uh, at Draft House, always used to say that I was a, I was a neophile and I liked new things, and I I, got, I was very bored about things that went on for too long, you know. Okay. Which I think uh, is an entrepreneurial <laughs> trait. I think. Yeah, that's quite common. I always wanted to do something new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're always developing and progressing. Right? Yeah, but but it's quite good to finish the things that you started the, the day before, you know, uh, which yeah. I didn't always do. Um, but uh, no, so okay. so yeah, but I I definitely think um, you know having uh, having a very open mind to new things and yep. new ideas uh, yep. and different ways of doing things is a positive thing um, yep. because you know you're very aware of what's going on in the market quite a sociable person so I've always you know known all the other people who are hopefully are being successful in the market and always yep. talked to them and you know made friends with them so 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 that has meant that you know you've got a pretty, a pretty good sense of, of of what's going on in the market okay the, the negative side of it of course is is um, you know if you're if you're constantly thinking about new stuff, I mean, in the end, it, it, it it's a 
it's a business which involves um, day-to-day discipline yeah, uh, sure. if you want to make money. Sure. Uh, I guess if you get the right people around you, kind of the operational well, day-to-day that, people. That, that was that it. Works. And we you know, didn't really have that okay. until... I had to actually, funnily enough, I had it at Woody's in, in year two onwards when we, we hired a, a, a wonderful man who did a great job running the club. But um, I, I never really had that, that operational, um, you know, discipline. Foundation or, yeah, foundation yeah. Until, until we were sort of five or six sites into Draft House and we hired a, a guy out of, um, out of Wetherspoons. Uh, in fact, he, uh, yeah, no, out of Wetherspoons, uh, okay. Richard Peachman, who came in and, and um, really enforced that kind of discipline in the business and that. Okay. The, 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 the key thing there was, you know, we had a brilliant brand. We had a, you know, really terrific reputation and generated a lot of press, generated mm-hmm. a lot of business, but we weren't really delivering the brand at, at you know, at an operational level. And so that was what changed okay. when, when, he, when he joined. I was That's interesting. Jumping around, but, yeah. no, but, 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 that, but that, that, I think, is a... You know, it sounds obvious, but but you know the the customer experience has got to be the experience of the brand, and if it isn't, then you know they're disappointed inevitably. Yeah, um, absolutely. I uh, think from my experience, the most successful concepts and businesses, I think initially they do focus on the brand and the consumer experience. So it's almost all of the front facing side of things. It's it's what the value is in at that initial stage, and then yeah. two three years down the line, you can start getting foundations in place. Yeah, I mean the the the, the, the you know, it's, it's, it's an established fact that um, word of mouth is by far the most important form of marketing in, in mm-hmm. hospitality. I mean, by far, whether mm-hmm. it's through social media or human contact or, you know, whatever. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so creating um, what Danny Meyer calls, you know, legends of hospitality, yeah. i.e., you know, you go to Draft House or you go to, you know, Butchie's and you have an experience that you tell people about. Mm. And you 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 create your own legend. Have you had the chicken at Butchie's? It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, my, the, the the story I always tell is my mum uh, went to the Tour d'Argent in Paris in 1968 with yeah. my dad. They were originally from New York, and they were on a sort of on a trip to Paris. And he took her there, and uh, the waiter spilled uh, like a drop of sauce on her white dress. You yeah. know, uh, and. Obviously, she was very upset, and he said, "Madam," he immediately said, "Madam, come with me," and took her into the some sort of changing room and gave her this sort of very smart dressing gown. And then, and then, by the time they they finished the main course, the dress had been laundered, and she was invited back into the dressing room, wow. changed back into her dress. Uh, and how many people she told that story to? Probably Amazing. a thousand since mm. 1968, mm. and that restaurant's still going. So mm. you know, the, the, these are the these are the legends of hospitality that Danny Meyer's talking about, sure. and setting the table. You know, and yeah. they're, they're really important. You know. It's, yeah. Attention is, to detail. Really. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's, it's a business like lounges, you know, it's it, a lot of it is in obviously fantastic product and service and 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 menu and it all served at a wonderful price point. But I think there it's the atmosphere in those places with all the crazy decoration and people people kind of go in and they're like, wow, all these family portraits and yeah. mad stuff, you know, and 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 it just gives you know, it's so different from everything else on yeah. on, on, on the high street. You Absolutely. Know? Which I think is is accentuated now with social media, the power of social yeah. media. So word of mouth is through digital yeah. and instant form now. So totally, I think those special moments or special experiences are just spread yeah. um, quickly and 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 wide as well. Amplified very yeah. fast. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. Indeed. indeed. So so I get um, how you kind of transitioned and pursued the nightclub. Um, obviously, you were looking for something new and exciting and to make a bit of cash. Um, where and when did the passion for hospitality and beer develop? Was it before that or was it kind of during? Or? Well, uh, initially it was about kind of, which I think is a good instinct. It was about trying to do cool things, you know, and okay. to be cool, you know. So okay. we were like trying to run a cool nightclub. Yeah. Behind it also was the idea that owning free, the, the freeholds seemed to me to be very cheap. So the first three businesses I did were freeholds and they were really cheap. I okay. mean, that definitely not the case anymore it hasn't been for yeah. many many years but at that time it just struck me that, that there was a massive difference between the price of buying a nightclub freehold mm. in London and buying a house you know it was just mm. like yeah, you know, it was like a third or something it was wow. a big differential I mean we we bought a 6,000 square foot nightclub in a you know Victorian building standalone building for 700 grand you know mm. I mean which even in 91 sorry even in 98 when we did that 
seem very cheap. So, so that sort of that made me feel quite comfortable about doing it because I thought somehow or other this is this, there's some kind of arbitrage here which I don't really understand, but definitely sure. it's very cheap. Uh, and then and then it was about trying to do cool things and just you know work out ways to get customers in, and it was just fun. And 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 it was also very much initially about uh, doing doing something local because we. Okay. All of our friends lived in the same area, and and we wanted to do things that essentially they would find entertaining. Sure. Uh, so that was, you know, everyone liked going to the pub. Everyone liked going to, 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 to a lot of these people had gone to the old Woodies anyway. We didn't change the name. Yeah. Uh, and then it closed for three or four years, and so they all knew where it was okay. when we reopened it. And we decided to keep the name for that reason. Okay. Then we bought the pub next door, which was a terrible pub, but it was on the canal and had a sort of hundred meter garden running along the canal and we bought it for nothing I mean it was ridiculous wow. we never should have sold it yeah uh, we did sell it for a lot but we, we I mean it was just an absolute cash cow uh, yeah. that pub yeah uh, and then we bought a restaurant in Shep's Bush and they were all you know places that were they were in locations where we we knew lots of people really 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 understood the market yeah exactly uh, and we I never would have dreamed of opening in those years, I never would have dreamed of opening something in East London or whatever. I just, I just, was, I'd never been to East London. I mean, I was just a okay. very parochial yeah. uh, West London guy, you know. Uh, and in fact, the, the the first big mistake that that I made was buying a pub in Battersea and uh, thinking I understood, you know, okay, well, let's go. This this opportunity came up. It's also the first leasehold I did, yeah. and it was a nil premium pub. And I thought, well, you know, what could go wrong? And actually, a lot could go wrong if you mm. buy a pub and pay rent and get it wrong. Mm. Uh, as it turned out, <laughs> and in the end, but in the end, that 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 that, that the, it, you know took a couple of years, but we got it right. But it was yeah. it was a very very painful couple of years. Um, okay, uh, and uh, with very few customers and lots of losses. And uh, but so so it started off very much as a parochial West London kind of project where okay. it was all about reputation and you know. Yes, we made money. Yes, it, yes, we bought the freeholds very cheap and all of that. But I think the real driver was we were like in our late twenties, early thirties, and we were we were trying to be like the coolest kids in Notting Hill. That's what okay. we thought was that was probably our real ambition. Okay, you know? and we start driving the <laughs> the concept and the brand and even decor and menu, etc. Yeah, et cetera, yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah, it was all driving all up. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all that. Just uh, trying to be the and cool like kids. Like the pub, like the pub, for example, we the, the idea of the Grand Union, which which was the the pub next to Woody's, was. It was meant to be like an old man's pub, so we sold pies, we did, we sold bitter, okay. and it was all the stuff that nobody else was doing. And we 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 kind of made that cool in Notting Hill, and everyone was like used to go there and drink pints of bitter and eat pies. You know? Okay, and it was kind of like a northern northern old fashioned northern pub. You know? Okay, yeah. uh, and uh, you know with a kind of Latin motto above the door, and it was just it was it was crazy, uh, and uh, and it, it, of course the press loved it. Yeah, you know, and yeah. because at that time. You know, an old-fashioned boozer was nobody. Nobody was doing old-fashioned boozers in in, okay. in the year two thousand. You know, yeah. I mean that was. I mean that that came all that came much later with wet lead pubs and craft beer and, sure, and all sure. of that. Okay, so uh, so so so. But we did it because we thought it was sort of we thought it was fun. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we just thought, well, why don't we try and do an old-fashioned pub and see if we can get people to come with a okay. pool table? You know. Okay. Uh, did you and, have an inspiration or, from somewhere, or somewhere you'd been somewhere else? Or? Well, we we used to go to. We were talking about Terence Conrad. We used to go to the Cow a lot, which had already opened at that point, and that okay. was also very old-fashioned type, but in a okay. different way. I mean, it, yeah. it, but it, but it was also very old-fashioned feeling, and um, <clears throat> it had, um, yeah, it was it was it, it was. Uh, it, that was a big influence and then we just used to you know obviously as students and stuff we'd all gone to a lot of pubs and continued to go yeah. to a lot of pubs um, so sure. um, but I mean the original argument for the nightclub prior to the pub was was um, that there wasn't a nightclub in Notting Hill and loads of people and not, not, it's not the case now but in the late 90s people used to go to Notting Hill to go out I mean it was a big place to go out yeah. and then they would go on from there to the West End to go to clubs and okay. we thought well if we put a club in, in Notting Hill then everyone will want to go there okay. and lo and behold they did makes sense um, yeah. so uh, having gone through Woody's Grand Union Pub and the restaurant in Shepherd's Butch which was a massive freehold uh, which again we bought for very little money um, it, it you know I, I we had three successes really yeah uh, and it seemed like um, you had a good foundation to build 
Yeah, but it, 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 there was a certain amount of arrogance, I think, that, that, that crept in where we thought we couldn't really do anything wrong at that point and okay. because we'd had three successes and yeah. we knew that the freeholds were worth a lot okay. by the time we got into you know, the mid-2000s. Yeah, yeah, and you're still so young as well. Yeah. Like, how was it working with friends of yours? And obviously, you're, you've been in so many teams now. Like, what's your... Well, the friend opinion? thing was didn't last very long because um, we did... The first year at Woody's was... was very much me and my two mates um, who were both involved. And then um, Dave then went off and did other things okay. for quite quickly uh, because there wasn't really a role. There wasn't a role for them. Fair enough. And uh, the, t- the three of us quite a bad influence on each other anyway. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it ended up that they drifted away and did their own thing. Okay. And I ran it. Um, so And I never really worked. Post that, I didn't work in a partnership with anyone. Okay. Uh, until um, until I sold Draft House in 2018, and then started kind of getting involved with as a as a investor and you know non exec in, sure. in 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 smaller businesses and trying to grow them. You know, okay, it's interesting because I don't come across too many sole entrepreneurs. I think most of them have some kind of partners in place. I think it's a different journey, and a different mindset, and approach to things. Was yeah. that like a conscious decision for you or did you ever think about finding a partner? Or? <clears throat> I, I think I, um, I think the, the, the start of Woody's was quite traumatic because, you know, having the three of us there and I don't know, and it just seemed much simpler to have one person okay. running it. And then I think I'm quite of a control freak, so it was quite good to okay. just... Be, but I mean, it, it would have been easier probably if, if I'd had, say, a, a chef partner or, mm. you know, actually had people who knew what they were doing as partners. But yeah. but but um, as it turned out, um, you know, one of the things you learn is you make a hell of a lot more money if it's just you. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah that's true. <laughs> I mean, I look at the, you know, I look at, there are quite a few businesses where there are two or even three. Three is quite common. Okay. I mean, I can think of three, for example, bar groups, be it one. Yeah. Uh, uh, bar works okay. uh, and Three Cheers, which is you know a, a gastro pub business, each of which had either have or had three founding partners, so okay. more or less I think equal partners. Okay. Uh, and inevitably, when you come to sell at the end, you have to divide it in three rather than one, which yeah. I think is, is 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 a big difference. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, and but I think but at, at the same time I think you know if you get on well with with it's a lifestyle thing isn't it if you get on well with the others yeah it's quite lonely being on your own yeah you know, and, and stressful mm. you haven't got you know there's only so much your wife wants to hear about you know yeah the travails of uh, running a business that, you know so how do you deal with that roller coaster ride like the ups and downs is it through the team that you're working with or yeah I mean I think yeah. I mean, I think I think initially, I see this. I see this with with um, you know some of the things I'm involved with at the moment. There's a, there's a reluctance to get very senior people in because you don't want your own authority to be challenged, you know. And you and you and you want to you you don't think control. anyone's ever really going to understand your vision for whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you kind of get and and also you don't want to pay large salaries and, and yeah. so on. So you end up trying to run it yourself. Yeah, and then it keeps growing, and it comes to the point where you have to start getting, you know, good quality people in. Sure. And suddenly, when you when you get your first really good quality person in to work alongside you, it's like, oh my god, why did I do this before? It yeah, yeah. makes life so much easier, and everything goes better after that because yeah, yeah. you know whatever their expertise is, they just nail it. You sure. know, uh, day day in day out. Sure. Uh, and suddenly, it just becomes this. Slick operation. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and also it's just a lot. It's 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 a lot. You you feel like you know there's someone, uh, or more than one person who you can, you know, bounce ideas off and, and yeah, complain to, yeah, you know, yeah, shout yeah. at, sure, you know. Whereas when you've got useless people around you, yeah, uh, well, useless is probably too strong a word, but you know, less 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 competent people around you, you don't sure. even want to shout at them, you know, because it's like it's yeah, not, it's not. You know, there's never going to be good yeah. enough, so there's well, not really the point. any point in shouting at them. <laughs> exactly. The solo thing, I mean, it, it also is not... Having that mentality makes it difficult to go in as a non-exec mm. in the company. Mm. You're used to this 
being totally in charge, mm. you know, mm. uh, and the learning curve of working with people who are more talented than you, mm. obviously, are running that business because they've built that business up. They know how to run it. Mm. And working out the things that you should challenge and the things that you shouldn't challenge and, and sure. how you relate to those people is probably, that's probably been the big learning curve since since I sold Draft House and started doing the non-exact thing uh, Interesting. In, 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 in 2018, 2019. Okay. Do you um, now consciously yeah. and, and I guess very carefully choose the teams and the type of people and personalities that you work with because of that? Or well, I think you carefully you try to carefully choose, you know, the team and that that's, you, you know, you, 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 normally the initial interaction is with the venue, right, or with yeah. the brand. Exactly. Yeah. And if you love the brand, yeah, and you love what it's doing for you and for for other people, yeah then you want to meet the people behind it and see see what they're like you know sure. it's very unlikely that they're going to be shit at it you know yeah. uh, if they if 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 you've had a good experience uh, and you sure. know that you know in the case of breakfast club there's been a queue outside Darbley street and any any number of their other sites since 2005 yeah. so something's something's going right exactly. you know uh, yeah. and butchie's you know what what i think um garrett fitzgerald his real uh, thing that he's amazing at, which is just so important and often underrated, bizarrely, in, 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 in the business, is just an absolute obsession with, with making the best fried chicken. Yeah. And not just once, but you know, creating a system to consistently deliver the very, very best fried chicken yeah. at a great price point. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you know, what, I, what I think I've done in part is to evolve what was already actually a neat brand because I, I can't remember his name but there's a really cool another guy from Dublin a really cool guy who did the initial branding who's a quite a successful brand guy did a lot of work for Nike and others and he 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 he, he did the initial brand work for, for Butchers and we sort of evolved that but uh, and we sort of underpinned it with some brand values and personality and so on to try and capture what was the, the essence of what okay. made Butchies great okay. but I mean the bottom line is is that um that all came very naturally because the because Garrett's you know relentless focus on product. Sure, there's lots of things Garrett Garrett doesn't know, but they're all things that you can bolt on. You yeah, know, exactly. You know, in, with management. Yeah, you know. exactly. Um, the but, core but, but essence. But what you can never there. what you can never replicate is is that recipe and yeah. that 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 total drive to to have sort of perfection in yeah. in in the product. Okay. Uh, and constantly evolving it. I mean, we've just spent you know, six months, probably longer uh, on the bun, you know, yeah. uh, and we finally, you know, we now know that we have the right bun. Wow. You know, okay. and that's been a big, a big project. Okay. How um, are you assessing, let's say, quality or, or high standard? Are you doing taste tests with consumers or panels or is that um, through selling them and getting feedback? I, I don't think we're at that. I don't think it's, I think it's too small a business for that. We're okay. not, it, that, that sort of thing is not, I think it's, Systematized. I think Garrett has got so 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 Butchie started uh, following a trip that Garrett and his wife Emma did um, around the states, and you know they they did a road trip round and 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 I and essentially started developing an interest in fried chicken and and yeah. and, and tried loads and loads of different fried chicken and became okay. real sort of connoisseurs of American different types of American fried chicken. Yeah. And I think Garrett has got a fairly deep understanding of fried chicken, uh, and uh, as a result of that, and then of course they did the whole street food thing in Broadway Market, and 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 you know, and sort of really the school of hard knocks, you know. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think I think he has got a good sense of of what is right and what isn't right. And sure. what, I mean, a lot of it it wasn't like this bun tastes better. It was like how the bun <clears throat> functions. You know, I mean, you would know that as a chef, but how yeah. the bun functions in relation to the, the eating process. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it has to be light. Yeah. Uh, it has to be soft. Yeah. But it also has to hold together. Sure. While you're eating. Can't fall apart. Sure. I think it's also the balance of the components, <coughs> the proportions of each as well. Yeah. Quite important. Yeah. But I just, I mean, I, I brought someone in to have to have uh, butchers yesterday and uh, it was the first time I'd had the new bun because I'd been away and it and it's only been in for two weeks uh, and 
I was, it was like, okay, this is it. I mean, it's definitely right now. Okay. Uh, and yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't bad before. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was great. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but this is like, okay. this is it's, like, it's we've, 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 we've nailed it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and that, I, and I, but I think there's a, there's a phase in, and I, and I think it's a, it's a bit of a tragic phase in, in, in the life of a business when, but it's also essential uh, when, you move past that kind of the founder knows everything yeah. phase into okay let's 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 do a focus group on the burger yeah and you get the feedback on the focus group you're like we don't like that feedback okay. <laughs> why do we do that you know? <laughs> but of course in the end you know you 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 have to start yeah having a way of listening to customers yeah. and suppliers and all the stakeholders in the business if sure. you're going to grow you can't just, it's never going to come from one person and it's yeah. how you how you sort of systematize that into yeah, yeah. the business yeah. um, 100% 100% let's talk about draft house obviously okay. you've had tons of successes throughout your career but I think draft house is probably reasonable to say that it's, it's one of your biggest tell us about that journey from from startup and how you grew it and then finally exited I should probably preface it by saying that although I, I regard Draft House as being a tremendous success, it was really quite a small business when we sold it. It wasn't Weatherspoons, you know. I mean, it, we, we only had 16 sites. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there are lots of people like my friend Alex Riley and Jake Bishop at, uh, at Lounge was going to end up with probably a thousand sites, you know. Draft sure. House was, maybe it would have done, uh, yeah. but um, it, was, it was a relatively small business when we sold okay. it. I have, I have much bigger ambitions for both. Uh, Butchies and and and, uh, and Breakfast Club in terms okay. of where where they'll end up um, size wise, but um, no. Uh, so so I mentioned earlier on that having done the three freehold sites, we then did this leasehold site in Battersea, which was a very challenging site. Yeah, and we tried a couple of things in the site, a couple of different formats, sort of pub formats, and they really didn't work. Uh, and then we we we, we sold the three freeholds. Um, of the, the three the three original businesses, and the guy who'd been the bar manager at uh, the Bush Bar and Grill in Shepherd's Bush um, had always had an interesting beer range uh, in it, it, in the restaurant in a way that was very unusual at the time. Okay, so he he had uh, been to Canada, for example, and tried because you know the Americans and the Canadians were already from the early 80s, they were kind of starting to break away from big beer. They, they'd had that consolidation piece a lot earlier than, than we had. And so, that, so their beer had become very homogenized and, and, and bland uh, and, and, you know, dominated by big TV, TV okay. brands yep. like Bud, Miller, yep, etc. Yep. So you had, you had uh, I mean, I remember, the, the one I remember is Sleeman's, which is a Canadian brand, uh, which we, I remember we sold in, in, in the Bush Bar and Grill, and and, and it, it made an impression on me because it, the glassware was amazing, uh, okay. and it just felt completely different. You know, the brands were really cool. Yep. The liquid had a very powerful taste. It was much stronger than 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 you know normal lager. Sure, uh, it might have had hot. You know, might have had it might have had an IPA type element to it, which was of course, you know. In, in, a, in a bottled beer was completely unknown really in the UK sure. at that point. Sure. Uh, what so time these this, what, what year was this? Uh, so this would have been um, sort of mid 2000s, okay. early to mid 2000s. Okay. Uh, and so we had that little thing going on, and 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 uh, Adam was a it was a great uh, salesman of these beers to customers, and so he developed some regular customers who were interested in these beers and. And then you know we I think we had our sort of second failed iteration of uh, of, of in this in this site and you know I, I'd, I'd sort of run out of ideas and Adam said why don't we why don't we basically take it back to being a very basic pub you know painted up like a gastro pub you know uh, and uh, and why don't we just try try doing a beer led pub you know and okay. put some great beers on and simple simple food and yeah. um, and there was no sort of brand concept or anything at that point it was called okay. the Westbridge Public House and Dining Rooms and um, this is this site on the south side of Battersea Bridge uh, but it ended up um, just gradually built up trade it wasn't quick but you okay. know we started just getting people quite interested in in the beers and so on yeah. uh, and um, were you guys one of the first to do that type of beer 
in London or that area or I think or um I no, I think okay. I think the rake already existed in Borough Market. Okay. From memory, and there were a couple of others, and there were people who were interested in it. I mean, we weren't the absolute, but we were, we were pretty much at the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, it built up, and it went from you know doing sort of I don't know nine or ten grand a week to doing sort of twenty k a week, which seemed like a lot at the time, yeah. Because uh, uh, it had you know when you've been, when you've had a long journey of low sales and yeah, loss yeah. making, you start making money. It's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, so. I just sort of thought, well, there's something here, isn't there? Because, you know, people have come in, they're interested in the beer. It's like a completely new thing. Mm. Uh, it ties the pub into what was then already an established trend of kind of slow food, of connecting um, food to, you know, where it comes from, create sort of authentic, so that sort of authenticity piece yeah. uh, to, to, to connect food, uh, connect uh, product wine, beer, food, whatever, to some kind of historical tradition. Yeah. So, you know, like we, uh, you know, outside of camera and car scale in the UK, we'd sort of completely lost touch with uh, the beer tradition, really. Yeah. And of course, the UK, uh, along with um, Germany and Belgium, uh, have got have got the three great beer traditions uh, yeah. in the world, yeah. the Belgian I mean, you could argue which is the best, but you know they're all they're all very unique, sure. very individual. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, in the UK, you know, we 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 invented stout. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, Arthur Guinness did a great job uh, yeah. publicising it, but it was it, you know porter and stout were the were the London drinks, sure. that, you know, in the 18th century. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we invented pale ale, we invented IPA, we invented all, all these types of beer, you know, uh, and then we sort of forgot about them. In popular yeah. culture, forgot about them. Cam- Camera did a great job in the 70s and 80s at, 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 at preserving them on the car scale level, but Camera had this bizarre kind of, uh, this is a campaign for real ale, uh, they, had, they, they, they had this bizarre uh, prejudice against anything other than cask. So the idea that you would, serve an IPA out of a bottle or sure. on on uh, on tap was complete anathema okay. to them. Okay. Uh, and so the car scale movement was really, sorry, the car scale movement, the craft beer movement was really about taking those uh, three countries' uh, beer traditions and reinventing them in a modern way and selling them in, in, in amazing looking bottles and uh, or on draft and amazing looking glassware yeah. um, and it had nothing to do with car scale and it, the, the, the really bizarre thing is car scale in the UK is really that's the real beer tradition and that's you know and that's the one that's really connected to mm. um, history that's the one which actually from a health point of view is really quite interesting because it's, it's, it's live yeast and it's, it's okay. probiotic and so on yeah. uh, but there's this, this strange uh, divide where cra- uh, craft beer fans in general don't drink Carscale. Sure. Uh, and Carscale people are more like, you know, either sort of rugby players or, you know, the sort of classic beer and sandals. P- purists. Uh, sort yeah. of pipe and sandals, you yeah. know, uh, geography teachers. Yeah. Uh, and the craft beer kids of the sort of, you know, of the teens... Uh, 20 teens were kind of hipsters you know yeah and the two things just didn't overlap at all yeah, yeah. sure uh, whereas in fact what should have happened uh if 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 it was a real movement driven by quality and tradition is 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 car scale should have increased its sales but car scale what happened was that craft beer kind of ate into car scale sales so car scale sales have been in steep decline yeah. for a, a long time and, and particularly during covid because you can't sell you can't sell car scale at home. Obviously, but it, mm. you know that's the unique thing about it. It can only yeah. be sold in a pub. Yeah. Uh, so that was okay. that was all the sort of stuff that was that was that was happening in the okay. background. Uh, uh, was there a, a, an education piece there that you had to promote, or was it just a, a wider movement? That well, was I think I think the key thing was um, the thing that was really interesting uh, and what, what, what which contributed to the ability of um, Draft House to grow well was that uh, 
the very quickly uh, once it started the craft beer thing really caught fire and and really captured young professional men's imagination mm. uh, and what i mean by that is, is that the, many of the craft beer breweries that started up and there have been hundreds if not thousands that have set up uh and i think many more have closed mm. uh, uh but were set up by professionals like yeah. accountants particularly lawyers for some reason and they were to leave their city job because yeah. they were so bored of going into the office every day and, and I'm going to set up my own my own thing yeah. you know yeah uh, and so and so there was a huge number of men and uh, men and women who who wanted to learn about um, craft beer uh, very quickly that that sort of happened ahead of our growth you know just started people and so people come work for us to learn about craft beer wow uh, and then they'd go off and work for a brewery and then they might set up their own brewery or they'd go and, you know, set up yeah. their own pub or whatever. And it, we, we became a kind of, uh, you know, nursery for people um, learning learning about beer. So that, that meant that we always, you know, we would always try and recruit those people, even though, you know, sometimes they enjoyed the product a bit too much, but, you know, there we are. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we would always try and recruit those people because... They had the passion, and then when the customers came in, you know, they'd be really excited about getting them to try, you know, whatever it was. And so sure. that whole thing of which the industry complains about, which is not being able to get great people who are passionate about mm. the product and so mm. on, not just automatons going about their job. We we found that relatively easy, and I think that really contributed to the growth of okay. because we were a brand and people recognised that we were. You know, doing the right thing with beer. Sure. Uh, you know, the, we, the we found it really easy to recruit as well. Yeah, found it really easy yeah. to recruit people who were, and so therefore customers really picked up on that. Exactly. And yeah. it became a sort of, but but I mean, I also the the other thing I would say about um, about the craft beer market is, and you don't hear so much about it now. I think it's sort of, you know, the the, the hospitality market's moved on. I think. And it, it, you hear a lot more now about competitive socialising and yeah. you know other trends. Um, yeah. But it is that although there's probably and I I, I I don't know what the percentage is, but it's very low mm. uh, of the market that is genuinely interested in craft beer. Okay. I.e., they follow it. Yeah. They know who the brewers are. Uh, you know, they 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 they're online looking at you know rate beer. Yeah. Which is a website where you rate beers, funnily enough, okay. uh, and and you know they are uh, up to date on everything that's going on in the market. And yeah. you know if you don't have the latest beers, they complain and and so on. And they so they're driving you know uh, novelty all the time. Okay, tiny portion of the market. And if mm. you try and live off that <clears throat> portion of the market, doesn't work. It, yeah, yeah. So yeah. really, what what you're then looking for is the the next generation of mega brands. Okay. So the likes of Camden, for example, is a yep. very, very good example. Jasper Cuppage founded Camden Town Brewery. Yeah. And he did an amazing job at, at uh, creating a fabulous brand, which was very sort of emblematic of that new craft beer movement, but yep. actually was, and it was very high quality beer, don't get me wrong, but it, what, what it wasn't was that kind of brewed in a bathtub, you know, totally authentic, you know, small batch. Yeah. You know, thing, uh, which is what that one percent one. Yeah, yeah, sure. And actually, once the kids, you know, learned about Camden, they just kind of said, "Pint of, I'm a pint of Camden." You, it would be very difficult to interest them in yeah, yeah. in other beers, yeah. partly because Camden was always one. It, it was always sold to us and by us at a very low price. Okay, because uh, Jasper was very good at brewing efficiently and 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 selling the beer at a, at a competitive price, and therefore. Okay. Therefore, we were able to sell it for less, uh, and and so people are quite price driven in pubs as well. Yeah. Uh, but it, but they just you know, whether it was Camden Pale, I mean, I'm obviously not only Camden, lots of other great brands like Beaver Town and sure, uh, sure. some of the German import beers and Belgian import beers that people knew about. Yeah. But it it it's a bit of a the, the whole craft beer thing is it, it what it really was was the changing of the guard on brands. Mm. So it was it was pubs moving from Stella. And well, you know, Watney's Red Barrel through to Stella, through to Camden. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and of course, AB Inbev owns Camden now. You know, yeah. uh, and and I think it was a it was a nervous moment for the big breweries and the big pub coasts. They didn't really know what to do about this movement, and sure. they knew they had to do something about it. So what sure. they did is what they always do, which is they Acquiring. bought them, they they bought the yeah, exactly. they bought the brands, and yeah. Heineken bought Beaver Town, and you know, yeah. yeah. 
as I say, ABI bought yeah. bought Camden. Um, but but we but we were just associated with that thing, and of course, Brewdog have come through, and they ended up buying us. And yeah, tell, and tell us about that, the big... that that exit, and in particular, so you reached sixteen sites. So mm. why did you decide to sell at that point as opposed to grow more? Um, well, what happened was we. Um, we had had a really great run and we got up to 10 sites yeah. uh, by 2017. Uh, uh, and we were set to continue to grow and business was profitable and, you know, it was a great team and, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, and then um, L- Luke Johnson had also invested in another pub co called, um, called Grand Union, which at one point had 10 or 12 sites uh, and then they sold off the crown jewels of that estate uh, and it was in slight financial difficulties and we ended up acquiring the sort of rump of the of, of that business okay. six, six sites okay. um, for uh, not very much money uh, uh, with the view to converting them into draft houses yep. um, and uh, that kind of woke I think that really woke the market up to the fact that we were a coming thing we were sort mm. of a, a big becoming a bigger brand sure with sort of growth potential yeah uh, and so Brewdog I think were looking to grow their pub estate uh, and they approached us and, and at the time it, I have to say we we'd, we'd converted a few of the Grand Union sites. This is now 2018. We'd converted a few of the the, 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 the sites, and it just it, it it was proving to be. Everyone said to me, acquiring another company is hard work. It really is. And I was like, well, how hard can it be? But actually, it was quite hard. Mm. Uh, and dealing with the people from the old business and yeah. transitioning them into into our business, it was all you know, it was very challenging. So, mm. so we were looking at. Uh, you know, it was it it wasn't going. I don't think it was going quite as well as we'd hoped it would go uh, at that particular time. Um, but also, um, I think they wanted to. They, they love the Draft House brand, and they wanted to buy the Draft House brand. I think what sure. they saw in the Draft House brand was that it was it was it was it was functioning well in <clears throat> what you might call B locations and in sort of B sites rather than A sites. Sure. So slightly off pitch or in slightly weird weird spots. Yeah. Uh, with That's the right destination. Lower rents. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, more of a destination thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think they, my understanding was that 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 you know where they where 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 Brewdog was in sort of ultra prime locations, they were trading unbelievably well, but they weren't trading they weren't uh, trading as well in in sort of B type locations. Uh, okay. And I think they saw this as a way of growing. Uh, growing outside that, okay. so it came. So it came at a time when we were having a. I wouldn't say it was a wobble, but we were like, um, God. I mean, absorbing these six pubs is is, is proving to be quite hard work. Uh, yeah. And existing existing estate was trading fine. New pubs, we we would have turned around and they were doing fine. But, sure, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a disaster, but uh, it just they they bid. You know, they put in a good bid. Uh, they then up their bid a bit uh, and. Uh, you know, we were, in the end, it was a decision for me about, I, in my head, I'd always wanted to go to 30 sites, 40 sites, 50 sites, yeah. and then potentially sell then. And I was really yeah. enjoying it. And, but it did feel like we'd hit a bit of a speed bump with this acquisition. And we were gonna, it was going to be very hard work the next couple of years, kind of getting through that and then going back on to the growth. Sure. growth. Uh, and so I ended up, um, you know, I was talking to Luke about it, uh, who's our chairman, and he was, and I was like, I'm, "We're not accepting this bid." You know, we've got to, you know, we're going to plow on and keep going. Yeah. And he said he's he said a number of different things. God, he was quite keen to accept the bid, and he and he said a number of different things. And one of them was, uh, you could do something else. You know, you don't have to keep doing this forever. Mm. You know, and maybe you would enjoy doing something else. And yeah. he, uh, and anyway, I thought about it over the weekend. And uh, I thought, yeah, maybe I could do something else, and, and and it just seemed like a, it seemed like a good moment to cash in and yeah. and and give myself the opportunity to have a different kind of life. Makes, uh, sense. Uh, Makes sense. And it was it was you know it was a long and arduous uh, journey. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, running your own business, as you said earlier on, on your own. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, and I think my wife was quite keen for me to you know. Be time. at home a bit more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she probably regrets that now. Uh, and 
and, and so um, you know, you get to know my daughter, you yeah. know, etc. <laughs> All that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, so we decided to sell. Okay. Well, in uh, terms of timing now, looking back, considering what's happened, it was 2018 yeah. years old? Well, it was, that, yeah, but it was quite a long time before. I mean, it was, was, it, okay. it, it, was, it, was it was two years before. Um, it was basically March 2018. Uh-huh. So everyone always yeah. says to me, and I don't always, I don't always deny it, but everyone yeah. always says, your timing was amazing. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it was it was amazing it in a bad. sense that anyone who sold the pub company before COVID was yeah, amazing, yeah. even if it was ten years before. But yeah. but it was two years before. Yeah. Uh, but no. But certainly, had we had we <clears throat> carried on, uh, we would have just been coming out of that whole Grand Union acquisition cycle, uh, and as COVID happened, mm. uh, and gone, we would, would have been looking to go back on the growth channel, and then we would have, you know, with the with the locations of our pubs yeah. and our model which was very wet lead, mm. uh, we would have been screwed. Would have we would yeah. have been screwed. Wow. wow. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it, it's interesting. We, I, I, was at, I was on a panel uh, event uh, yesterday afternoon uh, at the London Property Forum. And, um, uh, you know, they, was, they were asking, there was, a, there was a lot of talk about, you know, when is the shit finally going to hit the fan mm. on, you know, the leasehold moratorium and you know the, this this huge overhang of rent that's due in the industry. VAT increases, and et the, I mean, I my my strong feeling was that a lot of sites would start going back to landlords uh, at the beginning of this year. Yeah. I thought January would be a bloodbath because I thought people would go right, Omicron. We didn't make the money we thought we were going to make at Christmas, yeah. so let's just hand the keys back because it's just that's enough now. Yeah, uh, and that hasn't happened, uh, and. Uh, why so, do you think that is? is um, I think it's a number or? of things. I think it's a number of things. I think that the, 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 the rising tide that floats all boats, which was the furlough and sea bills kind of coronavirus business interruption loan scheme that yeah. Rishi uh, gave us all, uh, has meant that um, I, believe, I believe this is true. And I read it. I can't actually remember where I read it, but I did read it. And it seemed to be an authoritative source uh, that um, hospitality as a whole has more cash now than it had in 2019. Okay, uh, interesting. And I think that's because, you know, they have had, I mean, they may have more debt, but they have more cash, uh, ca- higher cash balances. Okay. So the balance sheet may, may be actually in worse shape. Yeah. But but the amount of cash in the bank that they have is is quite high because okay. they've all borrowed, have, you know, because everyone was... Makes sense. Everyone was sort of super worried about, you know, obviously going bust. Yeah. Um, borrowed as much as they could, whatever, whatever the bank would give them, they took. Okay. Okay. And now <clears throat> sitting on cash, you know. So there's potential to grow with that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, or, or potential to eke out, um, if you're a zombie business, and, uh, you know, going into, this is the other thing we were talking about yesterday, if you, you, you know, going into COVID, there were a lot of company, a lot of brands who had been through a number of CBAs. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Byron, like uh, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to libel anyone, but um, uh, Prezzo, uh, yeah. I think possibly Oaxaca, I don't know. Anyway, there was there were a number of brands who'd been through insolvency processes and sure. had sort of kept limping along and 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 finding new investment and and, and so on. And but there was a the feeling that uh, a lot of those brands probably wouldn't wouldn't make it. I'm not saying that about any one of those individual brands that I mentioned but sure. you know there was that feeling that there'd been an excessive expansion too much debt uh, and then um, high streets had probably been overpopulated with with samey mm. kind of brands and, and also a lot of those businesses <clears throat> had expanded so fast that they'd sort of lost touch with their culture and so mm. the actual offer the customer experience had been diluted, potentially been diluted yeah. 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 Uh, and so um, I think I think Going into, you, you would have expected those a lot of those businesses to go pop yeah. uh, during COVID, um, but didn't happen, uh, and because of the, they were able to borrow more money, yeah. uh, and so I think it's it, it, you know, that whole thing, and also and, and also there seems to be a uh, there's something called a vulture fund, you know, which are these funds that buy distressed ah. businesses and yes. there's uh, you know someone bought patisserie valerie mm. uh there's a number of these businesses have been sold to these so-called vulture funds and mm. i think they feel that they can buy something very 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 cheap and mm. then um turn it around and, and grow make hay you yeah. know fine 
so that's also going on. Okay. So essentially, I think you know you haven't you haven't seen this this um, you know this this mass bankruptcy thing that we you know one would have expected. You haven't seen a lot of sites going back. Sure. Now the 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 the, the leasehold moratorium, which you know protects people from having to pay rent, uh, ends. And I think it, this time I think it really will end mm. uh, in March, yeah. next month, yeah. uh, I believe, end of March. Uh, and we'll see what happens then. Mm. Because there is several billion of rent outstanding at the moment, yeah. uh, which hasn't been paid and which is, which is due. Sure. And presumably landlords you know, will want to take those sites back. But, you know, I mean, it's, as we, I mentioned at the beginning that, that um, you know, we're looking back, at, you know, now that Ukraine is, uh, is, is under attack uh, today... I hope that doesn't date the podcast too much. I suppose you can always edit it out. But, but um, uh, you know, in 91, when um, Iraq invaded Kuwait, then start, you know, triggering the first Gulf War, there was very much a feeling that if you didn't pay your rent, you were out. Okay. If you didn't pay your mortgage, you were out. Mm. Your house got repossessed, you know. Okay. And while technically speaking, that's still true, and I'm sure a lot of people have their houses repossessed, and, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of people get booted out of sites. I think there's a feeling that, particularly with the larger companies with lots of sites, that there's just one soft landing, one soft landing after another, and, and yeah. you wonder really when the shit's finally going to hit the fan. And I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but okay. but, but I think it is, it's intriguing um, yeah. to think about you know, where we're going with that. Yeah, we'll uh, see what happens. Yeah, and. What does the future hold for Charlie? How are you feeling at the moment? And do you still have an appetite and passion to continue investing and getting involved? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm not really a sort of, you know, I don't, I don't want him to think I'm a sort of billionaire who's got, who's, who's, um, you know, making huge investments. I'm generally speaking, make quite small investments. But what I do do is then bring in other money and help them to, sure, help the, help the, 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 the company to get themselves into shape where they can get, um, you know. Larger amounts of investment for other people. I mean, I have, you know, uh, I've invested. I've invested actually a fair amount in butchers, but but I, I'm 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 not <clears throat> I'm not like a one man private equity business who's investing millions of pounds into in, into companies. What I am really is someone I hope who can really help the companies to get mm. themselves into shape, You're adding value to grow, to set to set the strategy, to to raise money yeah. if they need to, and then ultimately to to, to exit if that's what they want. Sure, um, and uh, and as part of that, I will put money in. And as part of that, I would hope to get share options and so on as well um, sure. to to reward me for for delivering if we do deliver. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I'm, yeah. I mean, I've got uh, I'm involved in four companies. So Butchies, we talked about, yeah. uh, about to go to six sites. Um, would like to be at 50 sites. I think we could get there in the next three to five years and uh, lots of exciting plans there. Okay. Breakfast Club is much bigger business. So that's mm. sort of 20 million sales, uh, 13 sites. We just had a very exciting opening mm. in Chelmsford in Essex, which is our first kind of market town site. Okay. Um, influenced by the, the trend away from you know big cities that we're seeing post-COVID, yep. uh, that was site selection. Um, yep. We found a a nice old Cafe Rouge unit in, in, in Charleston that was fully fitted, so relatively mm. inexpensive mm. Uh, fit out. Um, and it's had, a, it's had a smashing open. I mean, it's been brilliant. Uh, and so that then points the way to, you know, yeah. exciting uh, outside of London. I mean, we were already trading really well during and post-COVID in Oxford and Brighton uh, yeah. and London suburbs. Um, but this, this, this says, okay, the brand has a much wider application sure. uh, and super exciting. Uh, and then I've, I'm in the process of signing up with, um, I've already invested, but I'm, I'm not yet on the board. I'm about to go on the board of uh, a, a, a delivery aggregator. So a Deliveroo uh, Dis- Just Eat competitor, competitor. Uh, okay. called, called Food Stuff, uh, which uh, focuses only on independent restaurants. Yep. Uh, we're in six cities uh, outside. That's Toby Savile. Yeah, Toby Savile. You know yeah, Toby. I know Toby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I didn't realize you knew him. Yeah. So he's a top bloke, yeah. uh, and they've got an incredible, 
incredible prospects, I mm. think. And mm. uh, they started in Cambridge, I think. Started in Cambridge. Yeah. It, it, so it's a great story. They all both work. They both have a, you know, they're very young, but they've the the whole careers have been spent in hospitality tech. So Deliveroo yeah. and then Trail. Trail came out of Trail and went into uh, it, well, they were made. They, they were they were furloughed. You, you probably know the story. Uh, they were furloughed in in, in March twenty twenty. Okay. And went to Joe Cripps, who's the founder of Trail, and said, yeah. um, "Can we? We've got this idea we've been working on for a while. We'd like to, we'd like to give it a go yeah. while we're on furlough." Yeah. And he, I think, he bunged them a few quid and said, "You know, knock yourselves out." And yeah. they and they did. I mean, they did an amazing job in Cambridge, mm. and and then it's a real bootstrapping business. It's not a sort of. Yeah. It's not a unicorn tech. I hopefully it will become a unicorn, but uh, I think they're still uh, going around on bikes themselves. I think. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But not not anymore. Actually, Toby was on the bike last week in Edinburgh because they was they, they, they yeah. had such a fantastic launch in Edinburgh last week that um, yeah. the demand was off the charts. So wow. Toby was back on the bike, uh, yeah. which I think is a great story. But yeah. uh, no, so that I'm uh, about to about as I said about to join the board there as chairman, uh, and uh, that's hugely exciting. Um, and uh, we think, I, I mean, I think the model there is, is, is the right model. Uh, yeah. And it's never going to be, it's never going to be as big a business as Just Eat or Deliveroo. It doesn't want to be as big a business as that because mm. it's very focused on uh, curating a list of restaurants in each, independent restaurants in each city mm. with whom we share a set of values around sustainability, around how we treat our people and, yeah. you know, uh, very much what you might call post-gig. So, you know, gig being this kind of unstable world of, um, you know, Freelance treating workers. people as a commodity. And then yeah. this is about treating people as people and, and, and treating restaurants as, as, as partners rather than as whipping boys. Sure. Uh, and uh, it, it, I think it will, um, I think it's, it, what's interesting is when you arrive in a new city, there's a sort of instant viral of people like, oh, there is a better way, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, and of course the restaurants themselves, I mean, you know, a lot of the guys, I mean, you'll be sympathetic with this. Uh, a lot of the guys who, who set up restaurants uh, don't set up a restaurant to be the next McDonald's. They set mm. up a restaurant because they're passionate about food, mm. passionate about people, uh, and yeah. love doing service. Uh, yeah. And you know, and often these days have an interest in sustainability mm. uh, and want want to live and work in the right way. Mm. Uh, and there's no uh, authenticity there. Yeah, no. and mm. and so for them. While delivery might be a way to increase sales and profits mm. uh, beyond you know, bricks and mortar, the idea of sitting next to McDonald's on Just Eat just doesn't appeal. You know, yeah. That's just the opposite of where they want to be yeah. uh, from a brand point of view, but also just emotionally. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and so food stuff gives them a, a, you know, a way to, 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 to interact with their customers, mm. um, which is... Um, yeah, completely different and yeah. much more in line with. It. And so, so we're looking for. It's not. It's different from supper, which is a, another delivery aggregator, which yeah. is very high end. This is not high end. It's yeah. it's same price point as yeah. a lot of the stuff on Just Eat and Deliveroo. Yeah. Uh, but but it's uh, it's 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 all about it's all about sustainability piece. So sure. I I think I think it's really fascinating. And ultimately, you know, we're 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 working. We're developing a model for exclusivity on that so at the moment we have a rate if you using us and using just eat and delivery okay and then we we're developing a product to 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 drive people into exclusivity okay where one of the benefits may be uh transparency on data so one of the real challenges for restaurants with uh delivery and uh the others is you don't, you don't know who your customers are yeah. So when when the the man in the turquoise kangaroo outfit comes in and 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 picks up the bag yeah. full of food, you don't know where it's going. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fucking shit. Yeah. yeah. That really is fucking mm. shit. Mm. So we want to we want to we want to break that cycle and 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 ultimately share the data. We're not doing that yet, uh, mostly because we haven't got around to it. Um, but and, sure. and and interestingly, I think I don't think that. Uh, Indie restaurants probably have even woken up to that fact yet. Mm. I think it'll be us to educate them. As, as, okay, here's your data, and yeah. then we'll also, as part of further services that we will offer to them, here's how you can use your data. Yeah, sure. 
Here's yeah. how you can communicate simply to your customers yeah. and increase sales. Yeah. You know, and Lots I think so. There's lots of different. Yeah. There's lots of different angles to explore there. And it's Absolutely, I'm sure they're doing very well. They're, they're top guys. Yeah. Um, and then the final one is a, yeah. is, a, is, a, is a publishing business which which we bought many years ago. Yeah. Uh, my dad and I uh, and uh, for nothing, uh, which 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 is run by my my ex brother in law Jamie Bing uh, called Canagate Books, based in, based okay. between Edinburgh and London, and uh, it's. Uh, I'm on the board there, and it's. I mean, I'm not operationally involved at all. I turn mm. up to a quarterly board meeting, but it's a fascinating business. Fantastic, so, very exciting. Yeah, super exciting. Not relevant Charlie. to uh, Food Motion, uh, uh, the podcast. Absolutely, but, but there it's, we are. It's business success. We love yeah, it. Yeah. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Charlie. And despite what you say or think, I think you're an absolute legend in the industry. Mm. There's a lot to be respected. Oh, I'll That's take it, all right. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a legend. <laughs> not at all. Um, just well, the scrabbling around. The successes yeah. you have, I think, and mm. the respect you get in the industry. Mm. Um, I think it's, oh, well, thank it's you. second to none. So mm. Mm. Uh, it's a real pleasure speaking to you. Mm. And best of luck in the future. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll do something together in the future. That would be yeah. fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks thank very you. much. Cheers. Cheers. Of course, we're on film. Yeah. <laughs>